Welcome back, travelers. And today, we are not talking about War of the Spark, per se. Instead, we're talking about The Gathering Storm by Django Wexler. The D is silent. So, this is chapter one of the prequel book that Mag uh, Wizards of the Coast is releasing that is specifically only being sent to people who had already signed up. Uh, you can probably still sign up and they'll probably send it to you anyways, but the point being that these are the next step in finding more out about the story. It is worth noting that this is written by a completely different person. Like I said, his name is Django, which means he's already got a bunch of other points. Now, Greg Wiseman, I think he did a great job with the thousand characters he had to shove into the book, and he did everything, he got all the story points that he needed to get. And over the course of trying to do these videos, specifically chapter by chapter, I came to the realization that it's kind of like a painting this book because the details if you look and squint at it you just see a bunch of dots and strokes and stuff and it's kind of it's not as appealing but when you take it as a whole it's like oh that's a work that's a work of art kind of kind of deal um, for that reason uh, as far as these chapters go the War of the Spark chapters I'm going to be doing chunks instead because there are chapters where literally nothing really happens except for exposition so uh, for future reference we're not doing that anymore. Mm -mm. But this story by Jingle Wexler, uh, Wexler, Wexler, I really enjoyed. Uh, it's a different style slightly. It's more uh, about setting an atmosphere than just getting rid of information. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to go, of course, though, through the whole thing, but um, I'm going to go scene by scene and kind of just do what I was normally doing with the other chapters. But in this one, I feel like there's just so much it, it, there's so much more to, I mean, listen to this. Rain marched down the boulevards in sheets like a conquering army, infiltrated the tiny, crooked alleyways, rattled the stained glass windows in the places of worship, and pattered off the trees in the gardens. In the squares, fountains overflowed and the drains bubbled and vomited up debris. In the underground kingdom of the Golgari, far below the city streets, drips became trickles became torrents as all the water slowly drained down through layer after layer of ancient architecture back to the long buried oceans. We get basically like an entire strata of the Ravnica's like layering of the plane itself through the description of rainfall. It's poetic, it's just such a good opening like the just the visual of it the brain is an army it's, and like it, it's it's foreshadowing what's gonna happen in the next book and it's just like oh i love it it's amazing it's the best it's fantastic so rouserek is basically going to meet somebody and as it, as it goes along he's basically thinking like okay this is definitely probably almost certainly a trap and i know that i'm going to meet up with somebody who's working for bolas and i i just i don't want to deal with them so, Rao's on that journey. He's he's going to this tavern. The tavern, of course, is called the Silver Curtain because, of course, it's supposed to be like clandestine and kind of super sneaky and literally no one is ever there, so it's only being used exclusively by people that are trying to do under the table kind of the deals. Well, speaking of under the table, well, Rao Zarek, who we already know, has is over there trying to meet up with somebody don't know who yet back across the 10th district which is like one of the most commonly like majorly populated areas in Ravnica you have Nivix which is where Niv Mazet who at the beginning of the novel the War of the Spark novel is super dead he is very much alive and an important character in this particular uh, segment because basically he's asleep because he's a dragon and dragons they do literally whatever they want. They don't care what time of the day it is. They're going to sleep if they feel like sleeping. They're going to eat if they feel like eating. And if you're in front of them when they feel like eating, they might eat you. Well, there's a Demir agent. And she is, like, literally just gliding on a kite sail kind of deal. And gliding to the uh, airy where Nivmazet sleeps and lives, basically. She gets up there. She's doing her thing. She's doing her Demir spy stuff. But you begin to realize that she is not in control. There's this, uh, this described, I believe, as like a serpent, a scaly serpent wrapping itself around her mind, around her brain, forcing her to do the things she does. And we get some very, like, visually, it's very interesting to imagine, like, a Mission Impossible style, like, there's lasers on the ground, like a, like a defense grid kind of deal, 
and it's literally like crisscrossing and chaotic and this serpentine presence which is Nicol Bolas of course is strutting this this meat puppet through these lasers because the person is equipped and able to do these skills it's just that them like nerves wise or uh, just general that individual themselves they would not be able to get through there but because of Bolas he's just like and walk and th they just walk through like everything they'd like and like a snake they slither through but basically it's it's she's just being used as a vessel for Bolas to do his dirty work without actually having to go to Ravnica and confront Nivmazet himself because why would Bolas do that so while all of that is happening with Spy you have uh, Rouser Wreck meeting up with Tezzeret. You may remember Tezzeret is the guy who has the planar bridge and, and he's uh, basically working with trying to get everything going there. But while he's talking to Rouser Wreck, he's basically like, okay, look, we got a deal for you. Bolas is willing to give you one more shot and then you will be, will you be go, you'll be golden. You'll be okay. You won't have to worry. And Rouser's like, no, because Bolas is literally insane and evil and I don't want to do that. I already, already, got rid of that. I'm not going to deal with you. I'm not going to make a deal with Bolas. As I expected. Tezzeret shrugged. In which case. His slow, deliberate pace vanished. Tezzeret slashed his metal arm, launching a spray of white-hot metal in Rao's direction. Rao was equally quick to react. Power flowed down his arm into the Mizium nodes in his bracer. A crackling shield of electrical energy sprang to life, sending the projectiles spinning away in all directions before curving back to rejoin their originator. The fight scenes in this book are extremely vivid. There's just, there's so much put into the the action and the way that characters move around. You can tell this person was given much more freedom to describe the characters and the areas around them and the events than um, Greg Wiseman was. Because he, this guy Wexler, Django, He's given you so much detail and description where you find out about the ambulator, you find out that it was originally going to be used for uh, like parties, but it was too dangerous. So Rao took it and he modified it and he made it better and he made it to a weapon. And so you have like very, very cool little details. This story I cannot suggest enough, cannot recommend enough, just off of the first chapter alone, because we've only gotten the first chapter. My only misgiving is that it took until Wednesday to get this chapter, so uh, I'm kind of rushing this video out to make sure it comes out on Monday. So basically, Tezzeret winds up just with those the metal that he shot out, those congeal into constructs that are then trying to destroy Ralzarek. But Ralzarek is able to take him out no problem. He's losing his electricity, and he begins to realize that these things aren't that much of a threat to him. And the Tezzeret literally just ran away once he had uh, done his thing. Tezzeret has a habit of just running away because he doesn't want to get killed. But as a result, Rao begins to realize something is amiss. That thief person, the one that was sneaking into Nivix to get to uh, Niv Mazet, they get there, they eventually like they maneuver around all the different traps and stuff and is right in front of Mazette and is able to put her hand on his horn. And just, it, it's very, very cool because they explain something that didn't really make much sense. Because um, Niv Mazette is the fire mind. He's a dragon. He's like, he's amazing, right? Well, the thing is, being a dragon, sending a human, a mind mage human nonetheless, to go get into a dragon's mind after that same dragon has already dealt with a mind mage with Jace, why would you expect that to work? So there are safeguards on Niv Mazet's mind, which makes sense. Why wouldn't he have them, right? Well, Bolas does not intend to take anything out of Niv Mazet's mind. He doesn't want to like take control of him. He wants to put something into his head. He wants to put an idea. And just the, the incepting that kind of paranoia or plan into Niv Mazet's brain is awesome because it's it's a way of playing to Niv Mazet's weakness in that he thinks he's really, really smart. And by thinking he's the smartest guy in the room, he's going to go with whatever his idea is because it looks brilliant to him. So Bolas just plants it and then once he's done that, he triggers the trap. 
He triggers a trap by just sending the person that he's been controlling into one of the stasis snares. They get caught and he's basically just wipes their mind of all like remembrance of what was going to happen and makes them think it looked like an assassination attempt. So you got all that happen and Bolas is basically un untouched. Rao rushes back from the tavern all the way to Nivix, which is basically across town. And it's cool because they note that he was a rain mage. That's not something that's really been brought up. Yeah, he's a storm mage. He's able to use electricity and he's able to use uh, like thunder and lightning and all that stuff to his advantage. But they've never really talked about the rain aspect, controlling water. But that's part of Rao's power moves as well, like his power suite. So that's really cool. That's a nice little touch that they added in there. But anyways, he, he's rushing back and he's covered in the rain because he wasn't before because he was able to keep it off of him because he has a magical umbrella basically. And he gets there. He goes in through a sideway. He's going through this maze because Nivix is a maze because it's literally chaos and brilliance put together. And he gets to all the way up to Niv Mazet because he's summoned and Niv Mazet says he knows everything. The reason that's important is because Ral this whole time has been trying to hide the fact that he is a planeswalker from Niv Mazet. He has been this whole time trying to make sure that he does not pose a threat to the dragon. Niv, however, already knew and he was completely fine with it. He knew that Project Lightning Bug, which was one of Ral's Rex pet projects, was actually meant to find planeswalkers. And Niv Mazet has been working on a way to modify it to create something new. So when Rao gets up there, Niv is already working. He's already like running through an idea because he, he suddenly had an idea in his sleep. He doesn't know where he got it, but he had the idea. So it's possible that that thing, the new thing he's been working on has been planted by Bolas. He's like, look, I'm not going to be here forever as the leader of the Zet. I'm going to need somebody else to take my place. And he's like, and I'm going to pick you. And Rao's like, this is what I wanted the whole time. Like, Ral has just been a very ambitious individual, but getting back to Niv Mazet creating a beacon. He has plans for a beacon using Project Lightning Bug. What's interesting to know is that the, the, the planar beacon is not the first planeswalker beacon in magic history. Originally, there was one, I believe it was created by a planeswalker named Ravidel, called the Mox Beacon, which used a sapphire, a ruby, and a jet. Jet is in the black stone, not the kind of jet. So, Red, black, blue. What colors are Bolas? Red, black, blue. So it's very likely that Bolas got the idea to create a planar beacon from the Mox beacon and planted that particular idea into Niv Mazet's head, resulting in the particulars of this event where all these planeswalkers show up and they get in a fight. Because this is the War of the Spark. The original Mox beacon began what was known as the Planeswalker War. Niv Mazet tells Rao, okay, so the plan is we're making this beacon. The beacon's gonna do its thing. We're gonna get a bunch of walkers here. They're gonna take down bullets. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be huge. And Rao goes, okay, sure, whatever. Niv Mazet then tells Rao, go. I need everyone, and I mean everyone, all 10 guilds on board with this particular plan I have set up to make me the new living guild pact. And Rao's like, hold on. We all hate each other. That's not going to work. We got 10 guilds and all of them are going to be trying to just undercut the other one. Why would they give it to one of the Peroons of a guild? And Niv's like, just do it. If you do it, you're guild master, just saying. And Rao's like, I'm gonna do it. And with that, this particular chapter comes to a close. It was super awesome. I loved it. It's fantastic. And I can't wait to see what next week's chapter is going to bring. I will see you guys in the next video. And until then, read this book and travel well.